Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's topic is Sim Train Demo with my friend Melanie Flores. How's it going, Melanie? Very good. Uh, thanks for having me, Joe. So we should probably put some context in there. So we did an interview, or I did an interview with you and Nick Strober from Lean. And we wanted to do a quick demo as part of that, but since there was three of us on uh on the on the interview that was going to be too hard and we wanted to we wanted to have a separate and so this is just a separate uh, i will call it a companion or a compliment to the interview we did with nick strober anyway um before we go any further melanie please introduce yourself and your company and where you're calling from today so i am calling well i'm 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 joining this call from alpharetta georgia which is just north of atlanta and i'm the director of solutions consulting with SimTrain. Uh, we're a tech startup based in Alpharetta, which again is a suburb of Atlanta, and super excited to be with SimTrain because what we do is we 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 provide a digital coach for everyone. We digitize role play training and coaching, and we our sweet spot is the sales, service, and support personnel um, with companies. And we base, we make it so that you can practice all those conversations that involve customers and all the software navigation you have to do. At the same time, we help people master those skills um, and perfect them, automated. I've, I've called it this, and I, you guys don't call it this, but I call it just-in-time training because it's something you can use all day. It is, we'll get into the details of it, but I think this is so important, and I think you guys will see this when we do the demo, is not everybody understands transportation and logistics. Not everybody understands the nuances of your business. So when you say, we're gonna have somebody come and talk about customer service, they're going to be talking about customer service at a very superficial level because that's all you can do. If I say, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have somebody help us on support. Well, unless they created something specifically for, for your company, which is very expensive, that doesn't work because they need support like make sure you answer the phone with a pleasant voice have a smile on your face it's it's nothing wrong with it it's just not good enough <laughs> so um sim train and we'll get into this in a minute sim train gives me that it gives me the company function specific training so that next guy who comes in as carrier development or carrier sales he gets trained in that I, so I love that. Yeah, it's been a, it's 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 been really fun to develop all of these modules and, and just be able to know that we're we're able to provide people with the learning they need. Like, and it's you can actually write it yourself. People in the industry write it. Yep. So, um, before we get into that, Melanie, tell me a little bit about you. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Give us some career highlights before you joined the Mighty Sim Train. Oh man, I I grew up everywhere. I um. Uh, I'm a military brat. My dad is retired from the Navy, so I've lived everywhere. But I was born in New Jersey, and um, after that, we kind of traveled all, all over. I mostly grew up in Florida, and I graduated from high school in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and uh, I guess in a nutshell, I would say that I am a... I like to say I'm, a, I'm three people in one. <laughs> I'm an engineer, a teacher, and a gardener, but not a gardener of real plants because I'm, I'm horrible with real plants, but I love planting ideas and processes and seeing them grow. Well, that's excellent. So where'd you, where'd you go to school after, after your high school? I, got, I went to MIT. I, that's I graduated. A, that's a with decent a... school. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. I, I said, I, I swear, I, I, I sometimes felt like the dumbest person there. When I first got there, I think everyone, maybe not everyone, but I know that's a pretty common feeling for freshmen when you get there. You get there and you realize, whoa, <laughs> I might literally be the dumbest person in this lecture hall. At least I know, I remember hey, feeling that way. The dumbest person at MIT is a <laughs> smart person. <laughs> <laughs> so but, um, I you know, feel really, uh, really blessed to have gotten the opportunity to go there. Um, so th I, I did graduate with a uh, chemical engineering degree from there. Um, so while there, I, I also 
you have to you have to choose a concentration. They like to make sure that you you don't do nothing but STEM classes. They want to make sure you're well rounded. So you had to pick something in the humanities or you know the more liberal arts field to concentrate in. So I chose theater arts, um, and I really enjoyed it. Which is um, it's kind of funny because you know uh, script writing is part of sim train. It's like the polar opposite. <laughs> Yeah, but if you think about it, like when you think about a chemical engineer, you don't think that they understand anything about the humanities or theater, right? So it's it's that's great that they did that. Um, by the way, I've had Andrew Kelly on my podcast a number of times, and he went, I forgot where he got his undergrad, but he got an enge- uh, engineering degree in his undergrad somewhere in North Carolina. I forgot which school. And then he went to MIT for his master's of engineering, and then he went and got a Harvard MBA. And I asked him which was what was harder, Harvard MBA or, and he goes, "Oh my God, Joe, there's no discussion." He goes, "Getting a master's from MIT was impossibly hard." And by the way, you, what you mentioned that kind of not feeling like you fit in, I heard Conan O'Brien, who went to Harvard, talk about going to Harvard, and he said, "He goes, I didn't feel like I belong there." He says, "I worked so hard to get there," and he goes, "And then I got there, and I, for a while I thought." I don't belong here. There's everybody here is smarter than me. He goes, and he goes, but then I started realizing like, you know, I guess I kind of belong here. I got, I got in. And then he said, you know, but there's not everybody necessarily who went to great schools accomplished anything. He said, because he goes, some of them were like great students, but not particularly engaging and not particularly uh, people oriented. He goes, which will hold you back. But he said, he goes, he goes, as a result of going to Harvard, he goes, everyone had an assumption about me my whole career. Like they thought, oh, you're the you're Dick Cavett. He goes, I'm like the anti-Dick Cavett. <laughs> 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 but anyway, after you graduated, where'd you go? Where'd you get, where, where, where was your first gig? Oh, gosh. Well, uh, first I, I worked for uh, Mark Merck. Uh, it's a pharmaceutical, the, you know, the Merck Pharmaceuticals. And I was helping build about. Uh, I was helping retrofit factories to make different kinds of, of drugs. Then I went actually worked for uh, Arco Alaska. Um, I, and I was learning about oil and gas production. I did that for a year. Then And then my third gig is where I spent the most time. After those two jobs, I was at both of those for a year, uh, kind of definitely dabbling. My, I, I, my husband and I had just gotten married and uh, we were definitely exploring. Um, after, after, living in Anchorage for a year, we decided to come back to the lower 48 and um, I went to work for corn. Somewhere warm. Yes, <laughs> somewhere warm. But I, I don't regret living in Alaska at all. It was the most amazing way. We were newlyweds. And so it was the most amazing way to, 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 it was, it was just gorgeous the, and a, a unique experience. But after about a year, yes, uh, we decided, okay, it's time to, let's go back down to where it's warmer. And so um, he and I both went to work for Corning. So that's where I spent, um, the remainder of my engineering, my time as an engineer was with Corning in their optical fiber division. So I, I, I was with um, their Wilmington plant and I was a production supervisor. It was, it was a union environment. I supervised 25 um, operators. Most of them was old enough to be, most of them were old enough to be my parents. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was actually a great learning experience. And then after a few years there where I was both in production and then engineering, I was tapped to be on the startup team for Corning's new Charlotte, North Carolina plant. So they opened a new plant in Charlotte to meet all of the demand that we were seeing for optical fiber. And that was incredible, just a unbelievable experience. The chance to just start up a factory from scratch. I mean, get there and somehow you need to make this this work. I mean, the machines, the, the machines had to be installed. They had to be debugged. You had to hire and train people to run this thing and make it a well oiled machine that runs 24 seven. And when it, it, it was just, um, that was also a, a transformational period in my life, just being part of that, that whole experience and working with the others on the team to, to bring this machine, this, this bring up the, the entire factory. Yeah. I'll throw this out there. Most engineers, uh, specialize and what you said is first you're in drugs which is one business obviously and um, precision required then you're in oil and gas obviously another very important space and then you're in optic optical fiber these are three very different kind of spaces yeah it's been i definitely i've I've pretty every i've pretty much dabbled in everything for my entire life like different careers different fields and uh, it's i think it's actually been uh, i can't imagine 
you get a curious living mind. any other way yeah just uh, just it and and then the beauty of that is then you can combine ideas from all the different places you've been and, and to to make an impact wherever you are now it's it's i think that's super fun i remember um when i was still in the 3pl biz we um there's somebody i worked with one of my managers and she would say to some of the younger people who were not pursuing the uh having the rigor they needed to with billing errors or other problems. And she'd say, you need to have intellectual curiosity. Why did you go to college if you don't have intellectual curiosity? And I was like, wow. I was like, that is so true. Like, because a lot of people graduate college and go, that was it. Woo. I went to school for 12 years, went to four years of college. Whew, I'm all done with all that. No, no more learning. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That, that just, yeah, no, no. The learning just is beginning when Should you get be. out, and uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I actually, I look, I looked for that when I was when I was in in the classroom. I just loved when I would see that that spark of intellectual curiosity, and in, in, you know, in my students. And I look for it in my colleagues. Wait, so wait, you you didn't get to that when we when oh. were you teaching? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so I was I was an engineer for. I don't know, like ten years, and then and then I um, then we started a family. Stay, I stayed home with the kids for 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 six years, and and part of that time I was in Ann Arbor. Oh, okay, go blue. Yeah, yeah, that's right, go blue. And then um, and then when it was time to go back to work, I actually decided um, I'd always I'd always had like a, a an interest in teaching, and I wanted to try to find a way to bring my my background and and uh, my love for STEM to young kids. So I. On a lark, I, I just called the school where where our two sons were going. They were three and six in the time, and I, I just first I said, "Hey, do you? Uh, I would love to get more involved in the school. I wanted to try to find a way, maybe to volunteer or something, to to try to help bring some some STEM related experience to the young to the children." And they said, "Actually, you want to work here? We just I, we just had an assistant teacher quit, and and it was August. And they said we need an assistant teacher for one of the classrooms." So I said, "Well." I'm not, I, I'm trained as an engineer. And they said, well, you're an assistant Montessori teacher and your job is to prepare the environment and, and, and be there to support the lead teacher. Um, and so, and you will learn how to do that, you know? And so I said, okay, sure. So I tried it and I ended up, I ended up be, being in the, in the early childhood education field for 10 years. Yeah. They, again, I, before we hit record, we were, I was sharing some of my background. I worked in engineering for many years, but then I got my master's in education and I was kind of the similar journey. I was so interested in the personal development side. And by the way, this podcast is an extension of that because I started as a blogger. I loved the idea of, of doing training. I did a ton of workshops, most from cost savings, lean, all that kind of stuff. But, but I love that, that the discovery, I liked leading these, these, teams basically but you also you can't help but learn lean when you're doing workshop after workshop and obviously if you're anywhere in ops somebody's gonna say save us many can we go faster better cheaper and i used to just love doing that kind of work and i always thought like the podcast is kind of then this thought was everybody wants to learn more about this enormous space and who better to learn from than people like yourself who have are experts in certain spaces yeah, you're definitely teaching through this podcast. You're, I you're hope. Yeah, I hope. definitely, definitely. <laughs> so um, where'd you go after teaching? So after teaching, uh, I ended up, I, I ended up, I did a short stint, like a year with Easter Seals of North Georgia. I was, I, I, I led the, uh, the team that implemented video-based coaching in the, in the topic of STEM for like 24 classrooms across Metro Atlanta. And that was that was a lot of fun, but then my younger son, who's who's sixteen, asked me to help him build a business, and um, he had he had invented this paper candy machine, and he wanted to see if he could commercialize the idea. And uh, there were some things going on personally in our lives, like some some health issues and things, that I said, okay, you know what? I think this is the universe telling me that I just go for it. So I, I turned in my notice to to. Easter Seals, and I jumped on board with my son. He was 13 at the time, and I helped him build a, an e-commerce business called OctoGifts, and it was selling these machines that he had invented that you make yourself from paper. They start out with flat sheets of paper, and you cut and fold it like origami style to make a an actual functional candy machine that would dispense candy. 
And I, you know, I thought that's, a, I wanted to help him um, see how far this idea would go. And I, we did that for two years. He ended up creating like kits so you could, so people could build them and ended up selling like hundreds across the U S. So that was, a. Uh, that was a that was a such a fun ride. I couldn't imagine. Must take after mom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I don't have the I do not have the mechanical inclination he does. I mean, he's uh, he's well. Very, you said uh, you said your husband went to MIT too, right? Yeah, yeah, he did, and Michigan. Yeah, go blue. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you, you I can see where your son might come to uh, some natural abilities in that area. <laughs> so so th- th- did you join sim training after that? I did. I did. I, I joined it because after once my once once Sebastian hit around age 15, he was in high school. He, he actually fired me. <laughs> he decided he wanted it. He's like, I'm going to learn more if a like, couple of things. I'm going to learn more if you're not with me and then I'm forced to make all the decisions. And uh, two, he just. And you said, that's fine. I'm not going to yeah. let you get your license. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, that, then I would have to still drive him everywhere. So I technically, there was no way I was not going to let him get his license. <laughs> but uh, he was just ready. He just said, I kind of want to just, can we just be mom and son? Like, I just want you to be my mom and uh, and and just it to feel like I want our relationship to be like mom and son. So I totally got that. So that's when I decided, well, I have, I need to find something else to just sink my teeth into. So I started looking in them and then, um, Pretty shortly thereafter, I ended up getting hooked up with SimTrain. Someone, you know, I knew someone who knew someone who knew someone. And before I knew it, I had found SimTrain. And the and the beauty of it was not only was it something that I was interested in and it was, I was so excited about what SimTrain's doing, but it was like, it was less than two miles from my house, which is unheard of in Atlanta. So I was like, I could actually walk to work if I wanted, which again is very hard to find in Atlanta. We'd lived in Boston where I could, I walked to work in Boston, but I was like, once, once we moved from Boston, I thought I'm never going to be able to have that luxury again. And, and now here I, I, I still don't walk to work, <laughs> but, but I can. can if I want. <laughs> yeah. Cause there's, a, there's no sidewalks from my house to, to the office, but yeah, that's, that's how I ended up with, with SimTrain. So, so what, what interested you about SimTrain? Oh gosh. It, it, it really intrigued me because it was about, it was about, um, teaching people how to how to carry out conversations. It was role play training and coaching, which tapped into my love for theater arts that I had in college. But it was doing it at scale, which means you had to do it in a way it was enabling it was, it was creating a process that would allow a business to scale. And again, like when I was at the factory, that's what we did. How you know, we would created processes and we scaled them. So I thought, oh, this is a chance to leverage, you know, that plus you know, I, I actually loved writing uh, to a point. I loved writing, writing SOPs and constantly refining it and then putting them out onto the factory floor. That's standard operating practices or processes, right? Uh, yep. Yep. I, I, I loved like refining those and then seeing and then just turning, you know, turning this over and then seeing uh, seeing our processes deploy and, and knowing that that, you know, that was part of the team that helped scale that. Yeah, I will say this when we'll get we'll get into a demo in just a minute. But um, what I love about what you're doing is it's and I know the application we're going to talk about is how do you get your your logistics people up to speed. But what you guys have created is something that you start to see a glimpse into the future, how people can learn virtually anything um, online and at scale. And that's by the way, that is one of the challenges. And we talked about it. I was blabbing uh, your ear off before we got uh recorded i think we do we have a real problem with education in this country by the way you can't find any of your teacher friends who say they like their work anymore they're all trying to retire they're all trying to get out and i think that used to be a job people enjoyed doing and somehow some way we've made that a difficult job and i think uh there's probably a million reasons but we need to make that better but i think also we need to be able to say uh i'm gonna i'm gonna meet you where you're at and so if you're uh, 18 years old and you can't read, bam, I'll give you this. And I don't care how old you are. You can learn on your own. Um, and I love this. So anyway, um, the way I met you um, uh, and Dan, the founder of SimTrain, is you guys are working with Lean Solutions Group. So what are you guys doing? Talk, talk a little bit about that partnership. So, yes, like we're you know, we are so blessed to have found Lean as a partner. Lean, Lean's actually, um, 
they they've they've been one of our biggest supporters and they're also an investor and um and we saw a way that we could there you know we we are actually are are made to the, the relationship is very symbiotic because they are trying they are looking to scale and our our company is a solution that allows companies to scale and we can help them grow and they can help us grow it's totally symbiotic oh yeah by the way i, I and for those of you who don't already know of lean solutions group or lsg they are an um, a staffing or outsourcing company so i think four five six hundred logistics companies work with lean a lot of times they're managing back offices and what they've done is they've leveraged people all over the world a lot in colombia uh, now guatemala now the philippines and i think they're one of the fastest growing companies year in year out on inks 5000 and um, um, this podcast is going to be produced by somebody from Lean. So Natalie, who works with me, she's a Lean employee, but she takes her direction day to day from me, and it's worked out great. And um, you know, it's an interesting thing. Right now, we're using Squadcast. You're in Atlanta. I'm in um, Michigan. But it really wouldn't matter if you were in Columbia. And that's I have I have Zoom calls with or I have. Uh, Teams calls with Natalie, doesn't matter. She could be an hour from me or 10 minutes to meet me. She just happens to be in Columbia. And so Lean is killing it. And, you know, you can't grow to 8,000 employees as fast as they have without doing something right. And the problem I think they have is how do we get all of these people up to speed like that? And that's where SimTrain comes in. Yes, because we make it you can, that you can you can learn anytime, anywhere. Uh, it, our platform actually enables you to to bring like uh, your entire workforce, especially even if they're remote, up to speed on something. All right, Melvin, let's take a look at that demo. Let me um, share my screen. So pulling up the Sim, what do you call this? Your dashboard. Yes, this is my dashboard. I'm, this is my trainee dashboard, and this is telling me I need to take this sim. Okay, what is the sim you need to take? So this is a simulation that is teaching me, a carrier sales rep, how to pitch a load to a carrier. So um, I can find out. I can I can find out more about what the sim is about by just there's actually a Netflix Netflix trailer type video I can watch right here. All right. In this simulation. You will practice pitching a load in under 45 seconds. Interesting. So now I can actually practice it a and few so, times. So this is before you practice. This is 53 foot dry van. It's going to be moving dog food. So you're going to be calling a carrier that has an available truck or hopefully an available truck. Yes, yes. I, I saw a, a, um, one post a 53 foot dry van load, dry, dry van in Dallas, Texas. So I'm calling this person to see You're if- You're gonna pitch them on your load. Exactly, exactly. And um, this this, this, um, this simulation is actually based on something that Isaac Moreno and Trey Griggs uh, built for lean. So this is, this, is, this is an actual lean simulation. I've just changed some of the words to make the demo shorter. To put it in context, lean uses this to educate their people to support their customers. But, uh, so you work with lean, they're an investor. But also somebody could come to SimTrain if they wanted and say, we want that. But um, th th so you have customers who are not lean. Yes, yes. These the, This simulation can be easily modified and customized so that it's using or whatever you need, uh, using their language. So this is what I would do. If I, so I'm Denise and, I'm, um, and I need to learn this skill. So here at first, I have a chance to just practice it. And when I practice it, I actually will see all the lines that I'm supposed to say. Good morning. My name is Melanie from Lean Solutions. How are you doing today? I guess I'm doing very well. That's great. I'm calling about your post of 53 foot dry van in Dallas, Texas. Is it still available? Yes, it's still available. What do you have? Great. I've got a load picking up on May 3rd at 10 a.m. in Dallas, Texas and delivering on May 5th at 11 a.m. in Miami, Florida. It's 30,000 pounds of dog food and the load's paying $3,300. Would that work for you? This concludes your simulation. So I could run that a few times, kind of get the flow. And then when I'm ready to just test, 
um, then I can run it in start test mode. And then I'm going to get graded on everything, not just content, but delivery. And I'm trying to do it in under 45 seconds. So here. Well, I've watched you. I've watched you practice a few times. I think you're good. So, so let's do this. Good morning. This is Denise from Lean Solutions. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Great. I'm calling about your posted 53 foot dry van in Dallas, Texas for today. Is it still available? Yes, it's still available. What do you have? Uh, I've got a, a load picking up on May 3rd at 10 a.m. in Dallas, Texas and delivering on May 5th at 11 a.m. in Miami, Florida. It's 30,000 pounds of dog food and it's the load's paying $3,300. Um, would this work for you? This concludes your simulation. Well, now I can see how did I do. Nice work, Denise. <laughs> yeah, the first time I forgot to, I used my real name, but here I, okay, so this tells, this, this tells me I, I, I missed three keywords and those show up in red here. And then, and, and then I scored well for confidence and energy, but I was in the red zone for concentration. So I need to work on that. So this is a, the, is your SIM score there is 32 out of 35. That's correct. So that's pretty good. I'd hire you. <laughs> well, thank you, Joe. So what's nice about this is if you felt uncomfortable that your concentration wasn't high enough, you can go back and do it again. I could. Until you get 100%. Yes, I definitely could. I, I could do that. And um, it's also something my manager can see. So this actually helps with those awkward conversations. I mean, my, my manager can look at this with me. And, and now we could look at it together and say, you know, if I keep if I keep scoring low in, in, in one of these, then it, it opens the door to a conversation. It's like, well, it looks like the reports are showing this. Um, what can we work on? And it, it gives, I don't know, it somehow makes it a less awkward conversation because you're looking at objective data and you're looking at it. It, 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 it provides uh, scaffolding for the con for a conversation yeah. that's sometimes hard. Uh, being a podcaster, I am sensitive to some of this because. I have people on my podcast who sometimes be monotone, not everybody and not most people and most people match your energy. Well, what you guys got a cool thing on here is confidence. So your machine learning or AI is judging whether Denise or you sounding confident. Also, if, if you're concentrating and also if you had the right energy level. So, where your boss just goes, I don't know, Melanie's okay, but not great. I don't, I can't put my finger on it. In a way, this quantifies some things that previously is not quantifiable. Yes, it takes the up the subject subjectivity out of it. Yeah, I love that. Also, just if you're not feeling comfortable, you just keep doing it. Absolutely. And the, the thing is that you can also create all these, you know, one of our customers, they love creating these crazy scenarios like the difficult calls and you throw this, those in there and you can actually, you can sprinkle these, people could take those difficult call simulations and just practice them every once in a while so they don't get rusty. So when they actually get a real call, um, they, they've just brushed up on the skills that they need. <laughs> right. Um, when I still ran a little 3PL, we did a great job and we had a great customer who we all, well, we liked very much. And his name was Effin Victor because he said Effin a lot. <laughs> and um, when the phone would ring, some of the women in the office go, I'm not talking to him because he was kind of crude, which now here 10 years later, we probably would say you can't do that, but he wasn't super inappropriate, but he was very loud, very demanding. And he was intimidating to even, I remember he would call some of my brand new people and go, bah, 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 whatever he wanted. And, and then call me and go, Oh, I just talked to your guy and he doesn't know anything, blah, blah, blah. I would have to call you direct. And I was like, would you stop torturing my new people? <laughs> but that is a reality. So if you have a customer who is 
difficult, demanding. Maybe, I'm just throwing this out there, maybe they have uh, an accent that's hard to understand. We do so much business with Mexico. Maybe their English isn't their first language. Yep, you could create customers just like that and simulate it. In fact, we've had customers take call recordings of their like tough calls and you can convert those into the sim voice. So that, no kidding, you are actually having your people practice that crazy call that happened three months ago and 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 and, and help people practice how they can handle that kind of call using so, actual voices. What if it, so much business is done by email? What if, how do I train someone using email? We haven't tried email yet, but that could be something we go into. I know that we are we are starting to to dabble in like how can you how can we train people on how to I respond saw, to I chat? Saw, I saw I saw a mess. I thought I saw a message that you guys sent. Are you wondering if we if we could somehow be used to train people on how to respond in an email? Well, no, respond to an email. Like I'm calling regarding your email. You can have a, a simulation where someone calls regarding you know an email, and then you can have the agent like pull up the email, and we can actually have the simulation show like the email and then what the agent should be looking for in that. Yeah. So I think what's nice about all this is all the scenarios. So if one of your people was uh, observing a problem at the port and couldn't figure out how to do what they're supposed to do on a timely basis, you create a class, you cr I mean, a, a sim. And it could be a 20 minute sim. Oh, like we actually sim. recommend they're only, they, they, we recommend like really short sims, five sim, five, five minutes or less is ideal because then they, pe people will, will retain it better. I mean, just like, you don't want to go, I mean, you go to YouTube usually right, for the right. shortest video. So you don't want to do that, do that with sims either. Yeah. But what's nice about all this is this, the just in time nature of it. Um, and for sales, this would be great also because you have to have product knowledge. And so often sales trainers, they don't know logistics. And even if they know logistics, they don't know how you do it. I did a lot of sales training in the past. And one of the challenges is if the boss didn't do it that way, it didn't matter what you were training them. So I'd say, do it this way, this way, this way. And then they go back and Melanie goes, we don't do it that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, this this makes it consistent. This This makes it consistent. So let's wrap this bad boy up. Um, this the company's name is SimTrain. You guys are partnering with Lean Solution Group. And so Lean is training the people who are basically the, the, serving their customers. And you guys are also selling this separately to other people. Um, cool demo. Uh, so last thing before you go, who do you guys serve? Who's your sweet spot? So sales, service, and support are um, actually uh, they, that tends to be who those tend to be the groups that are that benefit the most from our product. But we have been able you know, we've actually our software is used to teach software navigation as well for you know even groups outside of those three core those three core groups. Very nice, very nice. So what what size companies? Oh, we've got we've got companies all the way from uh, we from a some beauty salons all the way up to large banking institutions. Very nice. So do you guys charge by SIM or by monthly or how's this work? Oh, no, no, monthly not by SIM. It, de it depends on the, um, well, we tip, we, we charge based on number of licenses. So not by, you can build a SIM library as big as you want. It's so, we don't restrict the size of the library. We our, our our pricing is all based on the number of licenses that you have. And the license for each person who's using it? Yes, yes, yes. We are there is a, a per seat license that we charge. It's like yeah, I, it I don't remember the buckets, but like a, you know, from this many seats to this is a certain price and then so on and so on. But it's gotta be more affordable than sending your people off to training having them not in their seat that day. Oh yeah, it's like it, you 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 save in resource costs and in like speed. Like you could you could if if you are if you are um have a change that you want to put in like if you're if you're changing something in your software, you could write a simulation and deploy it same day to your people. Like no training scheduling required. It just shows up on their desktop when right. they log in. Perfect example is when we hit COVID. Uh the market changed, right? And all of a sudden there was new protocols. And so we might've said, 
uh, I was on the trucker side, I'd say, hey, guys, make sure that your dock workers are wearing a mask. Make sure you clean whatever, you know, whatever protocols you wanted to put in place, you wanted them overnight. And you could update them. You say, I, I, I did them on Thursday this way, a week from Thursday, I switched it all around. Yeah, you can, it, the, the, and it's you know, by making it a simulation, they're more likely to remember because they're learning it by doing it versus you sending them a memo or sending them a video right. and then saying, all right, watch this or read this because this is what we're doing starting tomorrow. They're not going to, they, they don't remember as much as, than if you just, you create a simulation where they actually, you have a, a simulated customer where they have to walk through it. What's so cool about this is you could be in your staff meeting and say, hey, what's going on? And somebody says, oh, my God, we had a real problem over at XYZ and this happened and that happened. And and if you thought that was applicable to some other situations, you know, we're going to create a sim and we're going to send that out. Everybody's make sure you take that before we meet next time. And you can check to see if they did. Right. You got that dashboard. You actually have it. The, the managers have a dashboard and they can see who logged in and who actually ran it and how did they do. So if Joe isn't getting the job done and, and then I look and go, dude hasn't taken all the training. He hasn't even logged in in some cases. So that also, it's also a, like a, it's a performance tool. Like you can, t you, people have actually used our Sims for new hires. Like if a new hire is supposed to take training and they haven't even logged in, that kind of gives you an idea like, okay, maybe this wasn't a very good hire because they're already slacking off. So you could use this actually to weed out people um, even in the recruiting process. Well, yeah, if you're not performing well and you're not doing the training, that means you're not open. And I'm going to have to let you go. All right. Melanie, thank you so much. Uh, what I'll do is I'll put a link to SimTrain and a link to uh, your LinkedIn profile and any other links you give me, I'll put in the show notes. Thank you. Well, this was, it was such a pleasure to to be on here. Thank you for, for inviting me and I'm just really thrilled to be able to share about what we're doing with Lean. And um, we're excited to be, we're really excited to be working with Lean on, on helping each other grow and helping other companies grow. So thank you for the platform. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I love what you're doing. Thanks, Joe. All right. All right. Talk to you soon. And thank all of you for listening to my podcast. Your support's very much appreciated. Until next time. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversation with experts in the logistics field. For more details, visit thelogisticsoflogistics.com or follow Joe Lynch on LinkedIn.